stand to your feet? Let us open up with the word of prayer. God, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. We give you all the praise that is due to your name, God. You are so worthy, God. We can't thank you enough, Father. We thank you for bringing us to this place one more time, Father. We thank you for bringing us safely, and we thank you for one more opportunity to get it right, God. One more opportunity to just give you all the praise and the glory and the worship on this morning, Father. We just ask that you be in the midst of this service, God, and allow us to receive what we came here for, Father. Don't let us leave the same way that we came in, God, and we will forever give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.
He goes before me. He goes before me. He's been behind me.
thank you for all the things you have done, have done, will do, and never will do, dear Lord Father. We thank you for another day, Lord. This day is not promised, dear Lord Father, but we thank you for this one, dear Lord Father. I pray that you watch over each and every one of us, dear Lord Father. Those who are here in attendance today, dear Lord Father, and those watching on Facebook Live, dear Lord Father. Lord, we pray that you cover each and every one of us. I pray that you cover the man that's going to speak the word to your father. Pray that this anointing will come out. Bless each and every one of us, dear Lord. Show God through them, dear Lord Father. Show them that your word will reign supreme, dear Lord Father. For anything that is not like you, dear Lord Father, we pray that you cast out on each and every one of us, dear Lord Father. Any insecurities, dear Lord Father. Any doubts that we have in our minds, dear Lord Father. Anything anyone doubting or lacking love, dear Lord Father, show them your love, Lord. Your love will reign over all, dear Lord Father. We thank you for all these things in your son Jesus. We have a special guest this morning. He asked me to keep it simple, so I do that. He served in a full-time ministry for 37 years, Campus Christ for Christ, I mean, Campus Crusade for Christ, seminary, senior pastor of two churches an associate of another, and middle school Bible teacher. Right. Currently, he serves as an associate minister at First Baptist Church of Chesterfield. He has been married 46 years to his wife, Chris. They have two grown daughters and eight grandchildren. Right. Will you put your hands together and receive the speaker of the hour, Mr. Modi. It is good to be with you this morning. I thank God for your pastor and the opportunity that he has given me and trusted in me to share with you his word. I thank God that I have been married 46 years to my lovely wife, Chris. She's been supportive through all those years of ministry and we have ministered alongside each other and we still do that together at First Baptist Church in Chesterfield. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we embark on what he has for us this morning. Father, I ask that you would say what you need to say this morning that your Holy Spirit would take my preparation, that he would take my heart, that he would take my voice, and that he would use all of that for one purpose and one purpose alone, to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus. And it's in his name that we commit this time to you. Amen. I've entitled this message, Why Did Jesus Die? But really the question is, the thing I want to say to you is, Jesus did not die so we could go to heaven. Now, before you think I'm a heretic saying that Jesus didn't die so we could go to heaven, I'm asking you a favor. Will you allow me to walk you through the scriptures? and show you why indeed Jesus died. And what you're gonna find is nowhere in scripture does it say Jesus died so we could go to heaven. So let's look, and I, I always think, when you're gonna answer a question, why did Jesus die? You should start at the beginning, right? Well, I'm gonna ask you to let's start before the beginning. And I want us to use our glorified our sanctified imaginations, if you will. And I want to give credit to a man that has uh, gone to be with the Lord, Dr. Larry Crabb, for helping me understand and share with you this imagination about what it was like when there was no heaven, 
There was no earth. There was nothing but God. Imagine three who, without a hint of competitiveness, are absolutely thrilled with the uniqueness of the other two. Who will not stop at nothing to give each other the opportunity to display their special glory. Imagine a community without even the shadow of evil, with nothing but perfect goodness, where every member can be fully himself without fear of promoting rivalry or releasing something bad. Now what the scriptures reveal about relationships within the Trinity, since the creation would certainly back up our imaginations. The Father intends to bring all things under Christ and gave him the name above all names. The Son has no greater delight than pleasing the Father. The Spirit loves to whisper Abba to the fatherless children and to present Christ as the perfect lover of the unloved and the unlovable. Now let's return to the beginning. Angels have been created, the sun, the moon, the earth, animals, birds, and fish. After sending the rebellious angels away where they organized themselves into a powerful enemy, the eternal community called a meeting. I can only imagine it went something like this. Let's create creatures that can fully enjoy us. We're absolutely happy with ourselves, of course, because who we are and how we relate is incomparably wonderful. But so far, we've created no one that can relate deeply and intimately with us. They cannot share in the unique joys of our intimate relationship. Let's create personal beings like us, to whom we can reveal the very depths of our glorious nature. We must, of course, take into account what that will require. These new beings must be built with the freedom to love us and therefore experience the life of connection or to love themselves more and experience the misery of disconnection. So if you have your Bibles or however you access the Word of God, let's go to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. I'm in the NIV version. We're going to look at verses 27 through 31. I don't know if it's your tradition to stand when the Word of God is read. If it is, will you please stand? If not, please stay seated. That's fine with me. God's Word for God's people. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will give every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, and they will be yours for food. And to all of the beasts of the earth and all of the birds of the sky and all of the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And while you're still standing, Genesis 2-7 gives a little more detailed account. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You may be seen. Amen. Amen. God's word for God's people. No other creature that God created did he breathe the breath of life into him. Only in the man, only in the humans did he breathe the breath of life. That's what separates us from the rest of creation. 
We are made in the image of God and his breath is within us. After Adam had named all the animals, God created a helper for him from his rib. And they were living in paradise. They were enjoying God. God was enjoying them. Everything was, if you will, perfect. It was wonderful. Then we come to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Listen as I read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Interesting, isn't it? Did God say you cannot eat from any tree in the garden? Why would he even ask such a stupid question? Because I believe he's trying to place a seed of doubt into the mind of Eve about the character, the nature, and the goodness of God. But let's look at Eve's response. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Is that what God said? Is it? Why are you laughing? Did God say that? No. No. What did she add? You must not touch her. Where'd that come from? Why did she add that? Is she beginning to think that God's not all that good? Is she beginning to question the nature of God? Has the serpent succeeded in getting her to add something restrictive that God never said? Remember what God said. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree in the middle of the garden. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. So Eve's added touch. Don't touch it. And if we waited a while, we might even get to the point, don't look at it. And we might even get to the point, don't go within this far from it. And then later this far from it. And eventually don't even go to that part of the garden anymore. Sound like us, then. I, I don't know about you, but my heart breaks for the church. And I'm not talking about the church that is doing what God has commanded and living correctly. I'm talking about the church that is added to the scripture, to the word of God. That's added to do not touch. That's added to do not look. That's added to do not go near. That's added to now it's okay to do that. It used to be God didn't like it, but now it's okay. I mean, churches are preaching things today that God has never changed his mind on because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those are the churches my heart breaks for. Because the truth is being distorted and touch and distance is being added. Now listen to what he says. So he's, the serpent knows he's, he's got her thinking. He's got her moving. You will not surely die. What did he just call God? A liar. God said you're going to die. You're surely not going to die, lady. It's not going to happen. God didn't mean what he said. God isn't who he claims to be. He's not all that good. As a matter of fact, look what he says. For God knows, not only did God not say that, he's a liar, but he knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Isn't that tempting? Is there anybody out there that doesn't want to be like God? Yeah. What God 
got Satan kicked out of heaven. I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. He did not bow the knee. He wanted to be like God. And it got him banished. And a bunch of his cronies followed him. He is questioning God's nature, God's character, and God's goodness. And Eve is buying into it. Basically what he's saying is, God's withholding something good from you. Something that would be good for you to have. That's why he's not letting you have it. Let me give you an example. It's silly, I know. And all examples fall short. Okay, I understand that. I hope you understand. Let's say my name was not Jean Monez, but it was Jean Deerberg. And I own Deerberg's grocery store. And after service, we have a chance to chat. And you and I connect personally. And I reach into my wallet and take out a card with my name on it. And I give it to you and I say, anytime you're in my store, everything you want is free on me. Because I like you. Nothing. You can take as much as you want. You want lobster? Take it all. Show them the card free. You want steak, filet, show them the card. It's free. And you're looking at me like, eh. oh, I forgot. Everything in the store except for double stuffed Oreos. You cannot have double stuffed Oreos. As a matter of fact, if you try to check out with double stuffed Oreos, they will take my card and rip it up and the deal is off. Now, you leave here today and you tell somebody and you show them the card and you go, look what Gene Deerberg gave me. I can go into any of the Deerbergs and anything I want is free. Anything? Oh, well, except double stuffed Oreos. And what are they going to say to you? Well, what's up with the double stuffed Oreos? Why won't he let you have those? There must be something about those double stuffed Oreos that's really, really good, and he's withholding them from you. Now, I've just gone from being the greatest friend you've ever had to not so good. And now, when you go into Deerbird, what do you want? Double stuffed Oreos. Right? Why? Because I said you can't have them. Isn't that exactly what Satan's doing to Eve? God said, look, Eve, everything you want to eat is available. Just not from the tree in the middle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because that would not be good for you. So what's Eve's response? Hmm. And the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was pleasing to the eye and desirable. And she doubted the character, the nature, and the goodness of God. And she reached out her hand, and she took some, and she ate of it. She went for the double stuffed Oreos. Then what did she do? She ran home, found Adam, taking a siesta, and said, Hey, baby, I got a double stuffed Oreo for you. No, that's not what happened. Listen. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What? Adam was right there listening to this whole conversation? Adam knew as soon as Eve went, oh, she was going to die. He was going to lose her. She was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Well, the only one. <laughs> He'd already seen two cows, two elephants, two of this and others, two of them. But according to God, she's going to be removed. 
Is God good enough? Is God strong enough? Does God care enough that he could either somehow restore Eve so Adam wouldn't be alone or create Susie? Adam's answer, guess not. Guess not. So they both lost the picture of God's character, of God's nature, and of God's goodness. And they ate. And the scripture says what? When you eat, you will die. But they didn't drop over dead. So once again, the scripture has lied. Or, and I like the or, or we don't understand the meaning of the word death. Death simply means separation. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord, separated. We've all, I would assume we've all been to a funeral where the casket's laid out, the person is laying there, and we go, that's not grandma or grandpa or Susie or Jim or Fred or whoever. That's just their body. They are not here. And if they are believers, they are with Jesus. We can have the death of a marriage. Separation. We can have the death of a dream. Separation. We can have the death of a relationship. Separation. So what God said is, when you eat of it, you will surely be separated from me. And they both bought in to the lie that God is not good. That God is withholding something that they needed desperately for life. We've all felt that way, so let's don't be harsh with Adam and Eve. Whenever we sin, what we're saying is, I need that desperately to feel good about myself. To feel alive. And what God said really doesn't matter at this point. He's withholding something good from me. I've got to have it. So here's the problem. God created man, Adam and Eve, man and woman, to have an intimacy with him, to be enjoyed by him, to understand him and to be understood by him. But they disobeyed. And now there's a disconnect between God and man. And God sent them out of the garden. Why? Why? Is that part of the punishment? That they can't be in that place of beauty any longer? Not at all. And I'm afraid too many Christians believe it's a harsh punishment that God it banished them from the garden when it's just the opposite. Let's look at why God sent them from the garden. Genesis 3, 21 to 24, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife to clothe them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Live forever how? Live forever separated. Live forever dead. Live forever away from God. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out and he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. God was protecting them. He didn't send them out to punish them. He sent them out because he loved them so deeply because he had another plan to somehow restore that death 
and bring them back to life. Bring them back to a rich, full, intimate relationship with him. But that would be impossible if they ate from the tree of life because then they would live forever dead. You see, Satan said, eh, God's not all that good. He's withholding double stuffed Oreos. God says, by the way, we got notice that the double stuffed Oreos have been tainted and people are dying. And I don't want you to die. So that's why I don't want you to have double stuff Oreos. It's not good for you. They can harm you. They can kill you. I don't want that. I care too much about you. So we have a problem. It's a sin problem. But too often, when we think of sin, what do we think of? Well, first of all, our mind goes to the big five uglies or the big ten uglies or the big one ugly. However many uglies you have in your life or you think about, it goes there. It's not what Scripture says. Listen to Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. Well, that narrows it down from... 10 to 12, or however many. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So, what are the two sins? Forsaking and digging. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Forsaking. You see, we have all these lists of sins. Lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, murder, whatever, 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 whatever. <clears throat> Those are just a result of forsaking God. You see, God created all of us thirsty. Thirsty for him. The spring of living water. But some of us have been convinced that there's better water over here. And so we start digging for it. And we dig in pornography, and we dig in drugs, and we dig in sex, and we dig in pride, and we dig in gossip, and we dig in arrogance, and we dig in lying, cheating, stealing. And we think that's the problem. If I could just quit lying, wouldn't I be great? No. If I could just quit stealing, wouldn't I be wonderful? No. If you could just quit, I thought I was going to say digging, didn't you? Almost had to. If I could just quit forsaking God. Amen. Then I wouldn't dig because I would be satisfied with the spring of living water. Yes. My oh, thirst my would be quenched. Yes. I would need nothing. Nothing. But the lie is you need something. And that lie has separated so, if the problem is separation, then it's not heaven. God did not say when you eat of the tree, if you eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, you will not get to go to heaven. He never said that. He said, you'll die. You'll be separated from me. So the problem is separation. And the scripture makes it very clear. None of us are good. No, not one. Our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. 
Now, I don't want to disgust you or gross you out, but here's one of the pictures of what that filthy rag means. Picture a leper with oozing, pussy, sores all over his arm, and he wraps a rag around it to protect it and to suck up that pus and that ooze. Now take that rag off and hold it up and say, that's my righteousness. That's as good as I get on my own. So how is that going to pay for the sin that separated me from God? It's not. It can't. It's impossible. But remember what God told Adam and Eve in the garden? So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. There's a promise that God is going to provide one who's going to crush the head of Satan. And he's just going to get his heel bruised. Now, do you think Adam and Eve understood that future promise? Oh, I guarantee they did. Because it says that Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. And what was Eve's response? This is the man-child I've gotten with the help of God. She thought Cain was the Messiah. She didn't understand the time frame, but she knew the promise. And God has reaffirmed that promise to Abraham, excuse me, to Moses, to David, to John the Baptist, to you and to me. So God said, I'm going to do what you can't do. For the wages of sin is death. All of sin. Therefore, y'all have a problem. And when I say y'all, that's me. We have a problem, Houston. We're separated from God, but now I realize I want to be back with him. But I got this pussy rag, and that's as good as I can do. God says, got your back. Got a plan. Got it taken care of. And Jesus went to the cross and died for no other reason than to restore an intimate relationship that was destroyed by forsaking God by not believing in his character, his nature, and his goodness. But saying, no, oh, this is better, and it's not. So you see, Jesus died for you and for me to be restored to relationship with the Father. And he did it willingly, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame. He did that for you. Now, there was a sacrificial system set up, but it was temporary. In fact, let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 10 about its temporariness. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. They covered it, but never could take it away. And then my favorite word in Scripture. But. In the Greek, it's Allah. A-L-L-A. But. 
But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The priest had a temporary job. That's why they had to do it over and over and over and over, day after day after day after day. But when this priest offered one sacrifice for all time, he sat down. Why did he sit down? Why did he not kneel? Why did he not bow? Why did he not lay prone? Because in the context of scripture and culture, you sit down when your job is done. Jesus is done. It's done. What else does he need to do? Nothing. What else do you need? Nothing. But what about that said nothing? But what? Nothing. But you don't nothing. You're right, I don't know you. I don't know what you've done. I don't know how heinous of a life you have lived. I don't know what ugly, ugly things you did yesterday or on the way to church this morning. But it doesn't matter. It's paid for. Done. Finished. It's for another time, but I'm the son of a gangster who the police killed in Chicago in 1958. Lying, cheating, and stealing are nature, are natural to me. It just comes natural. It's the environment I grew up in. When I asked my wife to marry me and went to her parents, Unfortunately, I have a big mouth and I told her about my biological father and his life of crime and being killed by the police. And she told Chris, her mother said to Chris, you know it's in the blood. And I'm not so sure I'd let either of my daughters marry me. But I later said to my mother-in-law, Mom, it is in the blood. But at age 16, I had a blood transfusion. And the blood of the gangster was removed. And the blood of the sin was replaced. Now, until the day she died, my mother-in-law and I were very close. Whenever she would call, she would say, how's my favorite pastor? Because Chris has a sister, and her husband was an engineer, so she was his favorite engineer. She got out of class. She had me. Jesus died so that we could have a blood transfusion. And it's done. It's done. So his offer to you this morning is to be free. Just like this day represents our freedom from the king. Our king has offered us freedom to be with him. In 1829, George Wilson robbed the U.S. mail stagecoach and he killed the driver. He was captured and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Some of his friends somehow got to President Andrew Jackson and the president issued him a pardon. When presented with the pardon, George Wilson said, no, thank you, I want to die. <laughs> the sheriff goes, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so they sent a letter back to the president and said, he doesn't want to be pardoned, he wants to die. The president didn't know what to do, so he sent it to the Supreme Court. And John Marshall gave this ruling. A pardon though no one would expect it to be rejected, is not a pardon if it indeed is rejected. So George Wilson died and was hung on the gallows while his pardon laid a few hundred feet away in the sheriff's office. Jesus died to pardon your sin so that you could be restored to a relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. 
That's why Jesus died. Do you know him? Do you have that relationship with him? Or do you just want to go to heaven? If there were no heaven, I'd still want to know Jesus. You know why? Because he's changed me. Yeah, amen. Going from the son of a gangster to the son of God. Yeah, yeah. And I know heaven's real. And I will go there. And I know hell is real and people will go there. But let me tell you what does not appeal to me about heaven. Streets of gold. You hear the story about the guy who died? He was very, very, very wealthy. And when the angel came to get him, he goes, can I take something to heaven? Nope, you just have, have to come as you are. He goes, oh, come on, let me just bring one suitcase. Finally, the angel got tired of hearing it and said, fine. So the guy packed it with bars of gold. When they got to the gate, Peter said, what's in the suitcase? The guy unzipped it and opened it up, and Peter looked in, he said, why are you bringing pavement? See, what's important to us isn't important. I, I believe there's streets of gold, but I don't care. I'm not going to look for Adam and Eve to find out if they've got belly buttons. You know what I mean? They were created. Do they have belly buttons? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not going to look for Moses and say, Moses, 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 why did you strike the rock? All you had to do was speak in the water when it came out. What were you thinking? I'm not going to look for Moses. I'm not going to look for my mom. I'm not going to look for my mother. I'm not going to look for friends. You know why? I'm going to be with Jesus. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because in Ephesians 2, it says that I am seated at the right hand in the heavenly places with Jesus. I know him. I know him personally. I know him intimately. There are very few people in this life that I know and trust. My wife, my family, a few close friends, but most of all, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do you know him? Or do you just know about him? I know a lot about Hank Aaron. Unfortunately, he's died before I had a chance to meet him. But I could quote statistic after statistic after statistic because I loved Hank Aaron, my favorite baseball player of all time. I don't want to be like Mike. I want to be like Hank. But I didn't know him. Never met him. I've even got a baseball autograph by him. But I wasn't there when he signed it. But I know Jesus. I know a lot about him. And everything I know about him, I know to be true because I know him. So this morning, if you don't know him, what a great Independence Day it would be to be free from sin and death and alive to Jesus in an intimate relationship with him. May God bless you with the hearing of his word and the teaching of my mouth that I believe the Holy Spirit has used in each of your lives. Let me pray before we sing another song. Father, thank you for bringing us together and letting us go on this journey, the journey that you set out before the creation of the world, a journey of why Jesus had to die so that we can be pardoned and have intimacy with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.
Psalm 73, 25, right. my favorite verse in scripture. Heaven is the presence of Jesus. Hell is the absence of the presence of Jesus. As you go this morning, I want you to go knowing that God's character and God's nature and God's goodness yes. is real and true and available to each and every one of you if you will call on the name of Jesus. God love you, God bless you, and God keep you. May his face shine upon you. May you go in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen.